Deepa, you can start. You may start now. So good afternoon and welcome to everybody uh, to this special lecture today organized by the ICS, uh, which is called the assessment of uh, the RV era and the road ahead. Um, this, uh, we are very fortunate today that we have Professor Shabni Roy Chaudhary, uh, who's I think known to a lot of us. She's an adjunct fellow at the ICS, um, as Professor of Japanese Studies in the Center for East Asian Studies at JNU. And, you know, it's, it's quite, been quite an authority on Japan. And I will tell you my own, my own uh, in fact, introduction to her was uh, very indirectly because I was in Japan and then I saw that a, so, a year or two after SIPA was signed between the two countries, uh, she was asked by the government of Japan, by Meiti, to do a review and see how it was working. And I was very curious to know who this was because the Indian side hadn't thought of doing this. And of course, it was, you know, we've run into problems. And it's probably a time now to do a review again, Shabani, and to see what we should do and whether we should rework it. So, um, you know, since then, we've got to know each other. And I'm, I'm really, really pleased that uh, you're here today. And we really look forward to hearing from you on what has happened and uh, a bit about his legacy. Everyone's talking more about his legacy than, you know, what Suga will take forward. And what are the challenges? So you know you could do, you could look at both of them. Uh, just before we commence, I just thought I would uh, you know make a few requests that you are all requested to mute um, yourselves. You can pose questions by sending them in the chat box. Uh, you can raise you have the raise hand option and unmute yourself when called upon to speak. I think these are standard um, directions that we have. And now just before. Uh, sh uh, we um, invite Shabani to speak. I just wanted to put this whole thing into some bit of perspective. Um, Abe's announcement on the 20th of August, I think it has received more attention than Japan and the internal politics of Japan has received in a very, very long period of time. I mean, there was a lot of focus on the, his illness, uh, the, the selection process, the election process, his, his uh, uh, successor and so on. And I think herein actually lies Abe's legacy because one had got so used in the past years, uh, almost a decade, eight, eight years and more to have Abe there as the face of Japan. And I'll take you a little back to uh, the period before that because uh, he stepped down the first time in 2007, again on, on health grounds. Um, and then there was a period before he came back in 2012 but by 2006, we had had our first summit meeting. It was decided, I think, under Koizumi, but it started in 2006. So we were having annualized summit, uh, prime minister level summit meetings. And um, what was interesting was, and I know Gautam Mamawale is here and others would be in JSCA, that every year our prime minister had a new interlocutor because every year there was a new prime minister at the summit. And I remember uh, uh, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh actually asking, because you know there would be there would be somebody else he was meeting. So to that extent, I think you know they, he brought in a lot of uh, stability into uh, uh, Japanese politics. And what he also did was I think he led the LDP into not one, but there were six elections thereafter, and uh, he made sure that they now were in control and had a majority in both houses of parliament. So it was easier for him to push his own policies. So certainly the, the, he brought stability uh, domestically. And in addition to that, also, I think the weakening of all the factions, which used to push and pummel each other. So there was, there was sort of a reduction in the powers of the, of the factions. But um, beyond that, um, Abe also uh, looked at two areas besides uh, domestic political stability. Mm -hmm. And one was to fix the economy. And I would come back to the Japanese economy. Everyone knew the years that it, you know, the, the problems that it was undergoing and, um, and its international stature. I think right from the beginning, Abe had this feeling that it was necessary to reinstate Japan's international stature and make it a lead player in the world. So this was something very important for him. Um, and uh, one saw it in a lot of the policies that, you know, that, that one, um, that, that he very, very early uh, in his time that he, that he came out with. So in terms of um, the economics, of course, it was the three arrows of economics. Uh, it was a mixed bag. Uh, when you look back now, of course, people are saying that it was a mixed bag to begin with. You know, it was a time, it was after the Fukushima disaster uh, had happened. There had been deflation for a long period of time. And things were really looking pretty bleak uh, for Japan with its own domestic sh shrinking market. 
So I think he came and he really, I mean, shook up the sort of, uh, in a way, we tried to revitalize the economy and in that process really shook up the entire the corporate world and, and the domestic econ the economics of Japan. Uh, he was able to push for a short period of time, the economic growth from, from red out, out of the red. Um, he was also able to, uh, in fact, if you look at the stock, uh, the, the Nikkei index, it went from about 8,000 when he joined to about what, 24,000. So there was a lot of, I think, uh, confidence and faith that corporate Japan placed in him. Um, and, you know, the period just before COVID, you do find a slippage for various reasons, the consumption tax that came in, a variety of reasons, international environment and so on. So I, one did see uh, the Japanese economy slipping back a bit. Uh, but certainly, if you look at the Abe, I think when we look from, uh, from a vantage point of history, we will see that he was able to turn around the Japanese economy to a large extent. Um, and um, he did this a lot, uh, but not only measures domestically, but also uh, by the outward, the, the um, thrust, um, the outward thrust. And by this, what I mean is, you know, he made corporates uh, and corporate Japan move out of comfort zones and look not only um, at, at uh, you know, Japan or, or uh, the countries that, like China, where they already were, but into new geographies. And this included India, and this included Africa. And Abi himself, he just traveled. I remember the year that I was there, you know, it was this frenetic uh, uh, spree of traveling across the world. And everywhere he went, he took large delegations of his companies. And what he did was that he used every one of these uh, visits. I mean, it wasn't only to profile Japan, but there was also very, very uh, important Japanese interests, which he combined very cleverly, actually, with ODA. So, you know, they, they came in together. And I think that he was able to, uh, certainly was able to um, make a difference. Now, um, again, on the economic front, uh, he will be re remembered for uh, the uh, TPP. I think the T TPP uh, and uh, how he went about it, despite the fact that uh, the Americans walked out, he ensured that this went through and you know took this form of what is called the CPTPP, I think it is now, uh, the Comprehensive and Progressive uh, Trans-Pacific um, Partnership. And also um, perhaps uh, as the success of, of RCEP uh, as it finally evolved with or without us, also much uh, can be placed at his door. In addition to this, there were some other, I think some of his other initiatives, lesser known, but equally important. So at the time that uh, China came with the, with the BRI a little later, I remember in 2015, while I was there, he came with this very strangely worded thing. It was called um, uh, a, a Partnership for Quality Infrastructure, and then Expanded Partnership for Quality Infrastructure. And this was really, really basically doing the same thing as BRI, BRI would try to do, develop um, and build infrastructure in the Indo-Pacific region. And he had set aside about $200 billion for that. So it was a very uh, ambitious program. I don't really know how well it did. And later, of course, he, uh, he joined this Blue Dot um, initiative. And most interestingly, I think this is all in the interest of Japanese companies that you find that by October 2018, he's actually signing on uh, in a way to be the BRI by going to uh, by going to China and signing 52 MOUs on projects uh, uh, with China because none of them have taken off is another thing but I think it is also the signaling that he was doing and uh, during that visit the other thing that he did um, uh, was that uh, you know he said that that Japan and uh, China together could co-finance projects so this was beyond you know just MOUs on cooperation but also co-financing of projects so very much in, in, in those uh, terms, very much uh, back into the, uh, in, in a way he had, perhaps not back into the embrace, but compromised um, on, on whatever reservations they were on, on China. On the foreign policy and security front also, um, there was much that Abe tried to do. I mean, he, he wanted Japan to be within quotes, a normal nation. Uh, so, you know, domestically, there was this uh, interpretation of the constitution to permit collective self-defense. And then he tried very hard for a reinterpretation of Article 9 of the constitution. He said at the end of it that this is one of the three tasks that he left undone, that he was unable to do. But uh, he also did something else which was interesting. He set up a National Security Council. And he also, um, you know, they, they drafted a strategy um, uh, called the... Um, it was called a proactive, the, a proactive contribution to uh, peace through international cooperation. This was supposed to be the philosophy of their security strategy. But what is important is really that 
Abi, I think through this process, he introduced strategic thinking into their foreign security policy. And when we come to India, um, what is um, uh, interesting is that we became part of this strategy because this was followed by the construct of the free and open Indo-Pacific uh, and then, uh, and then the, the Quad, the resuscitation of the Quad as a means to be able to achieve the objectives of the FOIP as it's called. Um, you know, uh, with the uh, cooperation of the four, four democracies of the region. So in all of this, um, uh, this more or less was, I mean, I'm very briefly saying what I, I think uh, were Abe's major contributions, but I do want to talk about um, the India-Japan relationship uh, because there's been so much of talk, particularly in our papers and among, you know, uh, various, uh, I think, various quarters, about how the India-Japan India relationship might change because of Abe stepping down. And um, I was, and I've been thinking of that a bit. And, uh, and one of the things was that actually this entire, this new phase in our relationship started before Abe. It started in 2000, and I think it followed actually Clinton's visit to India. So, I mean, the Japanese still look over their shoulders to see what, what uh, the Americans uh, uh, do or do not do or approve. And so that was, uh, you know, that was Prime Minister Mori's visit. And thereafter, I think the kind of architecture or the structure that we find to the relationship now, you know, which is kind of institutionalized uh, dialogues and engagement, that was put in place by Prime Minister Koizumi in 2005 and then followed up later. Now, what is interesting is that when Prime Minister Abe stepped down in 2007 and before he came back in 2012, we had the DPJ government. And the DPJ government, I think, continued the engagement with India. And here I'm very happy that we have previous JSEAs here. I think Gautam will be able to, you know, uh, talk, add something to this and talk about it. And our defense cooperation really started during that period, about 2008, when, Prime Minister, when uh, Defense Minister Pranam Mukherjee had visited, and then it took off from, from that, uh, uh, during that phase. Why I'm saying this is, is because uh, my sense when I was there was that there was a bipartisan uh, support, of, support across political parties uh, for a strengthened engagement, a uh, deepening of the engagement with India. And there was also, I mean, there is, there, there's no, no historical or political baggage that we carry. So um, this is also that there is a lot of, I think, general uh, positive perception of uh, India, general, maybe information about India, knowledge about India is less than it should be, but the general positive perception about India uh, in so far as the Japanese are concerned. And that gives a certain strength to the relationship. So what do we look uh, forward to? Uh, we look forward to Prime Minister, Suga, I think he's going to continue much of it. I think the sequence in which he called various national leaders is being talked about quite a bit, uh, that he called our prime minister before he spoke to President Xi Jinping and so on. Um, and we've already had the quad in person and then also the strategic dialogue. So we can see much of the same. But um, I, I just wanted to put this in perspective. And uh, Shabani, now the floor is all yours. And we're really looking forward to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... ICS for giving me this chance, Ambassador Kanta, Ambassador Deepa Vajba, both of you have been very kind to me. And after your uh, introduction, followed by the experienced speaker, it's very tough as a you know, person who generally has been engaged more on the academic front in understanding Japan. I would uh, rather start by looking at Abe through the report card the academics always want to do. Like, what is it? That is the report card we would like to assess him. Um, his assessment would obviously need to be looked up from the political uh, angle, from the economic angle, both as, as with respect to the foreign outings, that is with respect to the foreign policy, both strategic as well as economics. And finally, look into what would be the future that we would be looking into. If one looks at the political stability, the most uh, importantly, what went wrong when Abe stepped down was how he was the longest serving um, prime minister and how he for the first time got, um, gave this little island this political stability, which was far from wanting in the last uh, two decades. However, I think more than when he giving the political stability, what he really negotiated was to 
try and get some executive power in place, which will make Suga's outing much more easier. If you look at the political uh, contribution with respect to the executive power, one has to understand that when the civil service reforms were made in 2014 by establishing the Bureau of Personal Affairs under the cabinet secretariat, he ensured that he, the um, personals who were inducted as deputy um, director general onwards into the uh, ministries would have to go through the secretariat as well as the prime minister's office, therefore ensuring that the ministerial uh, you know, shackles that the bureaucracy is famous for in Japan would be you know, unshackled in certain small um, ways. And this, I think, is a huge contribution by him because I think it makes it easier for uh, Suga now to try to see if he can negotiate and launch a more policy in, uh, initiatives which would be more, uh, which was difficult for Abe to do during his tenure. The second thing I think which he, which uh, ma'am also, uh, you know, uh, touched upon is the National Security Council and the kind of changes that he brought in through the amendment of uh, the National Security Law, in which he ensured that uh, the NSG officials could uh, seek the information from the ministries directly. He, they could assess any, um, um, you know, conditions both for surviving, survival threatening situations domestically as well as that internationally. They could therefore come into decision of what would be required. This was a huge change because previous to this, Japan's biggest challenge was the prime minister's office had to negotiate or look at n number of ministers, which ministries which would come up with their own understanding of a disaster, which was so prominently displayed during the 2011 disaster. And one could see that, you know, coming to a decisions became difficult for the government. But with this platform, that uh, the prime minister's office were, was getting one, um, you know, place where the information was gathered and sent across such that decision making process became easier. The platform of NSG also gave uh, the prime ministers the issue of handling both the foreign policy and the security policy under one roof, which actually encourages the two aspects of um, uh, foreign policy as well as security policy to merge into the vision of the Japanese um, domestic policy making. And this, I think, is something that needs to be, um, you know, put on record with what he has achieved as a at the domestic front with respect to the security. What is also very important is what he did with respect to the peace and security legislation, which allowed for Japan to provide protection to US and its allies. It is basically the, you know, um, come under the collective security um, thing, which is an extremely important considering uh, that people who study Japan and who participate, uh, understand Japan would realize that as a pacifist country, it, the nudge of these small, um, uh, you know, uh, laws and regulations actually give us an understanding of how far uh, Japan is trying to move beyond its uh, restrictions, which has been in, uh, placed in its constitution just after the uh, Second World War. If you look at this particular legislation, what actually uh, this would allow for Japan to do is that the, the, the self-defense force has been now given power to, uh, which is little more generously, if you look at it, can not only participate in the United Nations peacekeeping activities, but it also can go beyond the United Nations mandate, which clearly is a um, huge step in directions of wanting to become a normal state. And that is something that I think anyone who is uh, interested in Japan always keeps an eye on that how much of normalcy one could gain. Unfortunately, when uh, you know today we look at it, we cannot uh, really appreciate what uh, Abe said in the beginning of 2020 when he had said, and I quote, that the self-defense force existence should firmly be defined in the constitution. He was very keen to change the constitution within these two years that he had. And he said that while he would, we would keep the first and the second part of the article nine intact, but we would include within the agenda the, you know, the, the larger role of the self-defense force and unfortunately with the COVID and of course with his ill health, I, I do not know how far the 
current regime would want to place it up, up front because of the he is suga is going to face an election in the next year so i do not think this particular aspect and this is probably one thing if you look at his the mandate with which which he came to power in 2012 probably this is significant uh, miss for uh, for abe because he could not do much with the constitution but what is also uh, came to forefront when we saw the covid situation is that while he tried to execute more uh, gain more power for the executive um, role unfortunately the pandemic did show that um, you know the national government did not have the emergency power to declare emergency across the country and you could see how uh, the osaka and uh, tokyo governors take leadership initiatives to go ahead with their uh, uh, understanding of how to control the covid situation and the hokkaido governor coming up with a lockdown for the first uh, even before the national lockdown could be declared this shows that you know in, in japan um, probably needs to now relook reinvent how it one wants to go ahead uh, politically within its domestic system to create probably more um, regulations and rules and see whether the structure that uh, has existed so far and proved uh, definitely fruitful to uh, ensure that japan rose to the ranks of uh, economically to the second power now currently the third power however i think the covid situation brought to the forefront a large amount of gaps that exist with respect to smooth operation of a country in create in uh, kind of crisis that we are fa that they faced at this point of time and this is something probably would be one of the agenda that would come into picture once a stability on the on the political front is achieved after the same election coming uh, in the next year um if one was to move to the economics and uh, Chip, uh, abe came into uh, power with this abenomics and i remember the kind of enthusiasm that was created among the practitioners as well as uh, the theoretical uh, theoreticians of economics to understand what was abenomics abenomics for a initial stage was considered to be basically a monetary easing kind of a um, uh, thing which uh, uh, monitoring easing policy which basically kurada said was basically to attract not only corporates to come back to japan but also allow for foreign investments and foreign ownership to be allowed within japan and that really gave rise to a, a momentous um, you know growth in the nikkei followed by um, you know changes that it was brought into with the corporate governance that lots of money flowed back into the country and one presumed that one could achieve what he set out for with the 2% growth rate with the 2% inflation but unfortunately by 2019 we was pretty sure that uh, the move wasn't going to happen uh, though he negotiated very well the consumption tax twice over in which many prime ministers actually lost their seats he was able to negotiate his fractions but however that did not you know that really went against this economic recovery program that he had set out himself for abenomics third um, you know arrow seems to be multifaceted and he was supposed to give um, you know some leadership to many structural changes that was to come up one two structural changes that was talked upon uh, even in the very beginning one was the womenomics or you know abenomics into you know allowing for women participation i think out here he did a great job and one could probably give him an a plus for this because he increased the uh, the number of uh, women in the Uh, corporate as well as you know lead roles and you can say sees today the statistically that 70% increase of women participation in labor force has happened but question is did he uh, get far with how far did he get with the uh, gender equality and that is where uh, one would question you know whether participation is good enough because gender equality he has not scored too well he uh, today uh, japan stands uh, 19th in an index of 118 countries and it's only point 0.116 which is you know leaning more towards inequality rather than towards equality and that essentially you know is a question that would be uh, asked often when we look at womenomics and uh, abe's contribution towards it the third and more important aspect which was talked about was to revitalize the regional thing move away people from the tokyo and osaka and make regions much more viable and profitable to work as well as to 
gain some amount of um, equality across region. He started off very well with uh, looking towards public works scheme, uh, which basically looked at uh, resilient against the natural disaster because he just came in after that huge disaster of 2011. And this uh, scheme was uh, well um, uh, taken in by the municipal corporations because it actually allowed for more infrastructure building and um, you know beautifying the countryside, allowing for more domestic uh, tourism to happen, which was essentially looked upon as a way to encourage people to stay back or move back to the regions. Unfortunately, the statistics are as it turns uh, out in 2019, because 2020, of course, has seen more people going back home because of the COVID crisis. But 2019 actually saw an increase of uh, around 18% of people moving to uh, Tokyo. And that um, does show that this particular scheme probably did not um, you know, really have a strong effect on, at the ground level. The second and very uh, interesting way of um, trying to encourage people to look at region was to look at, uh, came, uh, was this new idea of hometown tax payment. That is among the amount of money that you pay as tax to the government, some of it you could actually uh, siphon it off to any regional hometown that you would like to promote. This was in interestingly a uh, scheme that was that had a lot of uh, advocacy from Sugo as a cabinet uh, secretary at that point of time, and it is considered to be one of his major contribution um, from the sidelines. Unfortunately, while it took off, it had a right uh, uh, principle in place. At the ground level, there was a lot of infighting among these corporates, uh, 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 sorry, uh, municipal corporations to and corporates to sort of attract um, money from these taxpayers and, uh, and encouraging by giving them gifts, which actually led to a lot of few corruption scandals. And it was therefore questioned today whether this particular aspect was going to be, uh, uh, could actually be a good way. But in principle, it basically meant encouraging people to donate or to look towards home uh, regional um, cities, which could have been a way of trying to encourage people to go back to the regions. Uh, with agriculture, interestingly, in spite of such a strong lobby, as all of us know in the LDP is uh, full of agriculture lobbyists, in spite of it, he was able to deregulate the agriculture and allow for corporate farmings to happen. And if you look at, um, because he went forward with TPP, he generally, he needed to deregulate uh, the agriculture sector and he did it wisely and allowing for corporate farming. But if you look at the bottom line of whether the food uh, sufficiency was um, achieved during um, uh, Abbey, it actually, uh, the, the numericals do not add up. We actually, uh, the calorie-based food sufficiency of um, um, Japan stays, uh, stays at only 38%, which is not a very great indicator for a country which needs to have much more, um, needs to have done more work on the food security. Uh, the one other aspect within the domestic but has a strong implication to the foreign policy is the export of arms, uh, export policy for easing of arms trade. And this particular aspect uh, was, uh, you know, something that we in India-Japan relations say is one of the new areas or domain that would open up between the two countries. It is basically a more, not uh, so much to do with arms export, but much to do with arms technological exports and um, you know, uh, sharing of uh, cooperation and defense sector. Uh, for Japan, uh, it also uh, sense, uh, gives a sense of uh, independence to that of um, uh, Japan's you know, move beyond um, being an ally within the alliance system of USA. And this was a, something that I think was uh, much uh, delayed but yet it was something that probably for Japan, a way out from its economic um, crisis. And uh, it was felt that with this, they would be able to, um, you know, get into, uh, you know, arms trade with uh, important uh, countries and would try to establish themselves as suppliers of arms and ammunitions. But however, 
um, it is said that the, because Japan has not learned the way to negotiate into these kind of consortiums, that uh, Japan has not been able to really make a mark for themselves. And probably this is one place that um, Suga would have to work towards uh, understanding how to help Japanese companies uh, who were working this consortium to learn how to work within the framework that has been established with respect to this industry. Um, this obviously then moves me to the foreign policy um, area and uh, what is, of course, important to know is because he was such a long uh, serving prime minister, he actually outnumbered the G7 leaders and therefore his stature in the international meetings towards the end was exceptional. Uh, he was obviously a very savvy negotiator and very pragmatic. Otherwise, how was he able to negotiate with Trump and his burden sharing concept? as well as with you know, uh, President Xi, how he, from a very, very cold handshake that he uh, and President Xi had, the, had had at the beginning of his tenure towards having some kind of space within uh, China's um, foreign policy and trying to create for himself a place within his, uh, this um, country, with this country is something that one should actually take into account when one looks into the foreign policy um, records of uh, Abbey. But of course, his most popularized is the free and open Indo-Pacific, which he started in our country when he addressed the parliament by saying confluence of the two seas. In this arc, he obviously put India pretty strongly in, in it. And that is why, you know, if you look at the India-Japan relationship, it will move from economics to the strategic engagement. We will talk about it in the uh, after I finish off with the international outing that Japan had with respect to uh, Abbey. Um, one thing, of course, which uh, Ma'am also addressed is the TPP. You know, once when USA actually uh, walked out of the TPP, one sort of at that point of time thought that the TPP will see a natural death. But uh, I think um, Abbey's, it was essentially as this, his tenacious way of uh, prodding through this thing, which he really thought was an important um, you know, platform to use with the Pacific uh, countries, that he went ahead and tried to unite the smaller countries together and come up with what is comprehensive and progressive agreement for TPP. And it is this TPP which actually encouraged him to look towards this multilateral agreement without USA, gave him a sure footing to look at uh, RCEP because he then realized that he can go forward with uh, multilateral engagement, at least economically independent of USA. And this I think would be something that a legacy that he, live, uh, he will leave behind for the future, which would actually initiate Japan to look beyond always um, you know, having blessings from the US. And I think that uh, I would really feel is why the new era that he talked about for uh, ASEAN, uh, ASEAN and um, collaboration with Japan, as well as for new Asia that he uh, called uh, uh, out to, would probably see some uh, fruitful conclusions in the economic front with these two strong multilateral arrangements that he had uh, negotiated. But let us not forget that he, as he moved across and tried to find new friends, not only in India and Africa, he also reached out to European Union towards the end of his uh, 2019. And we saw that, um, you know, he not only gained the trade deal with the European Union, but he made this uh, Europe attention uh, move to Indo-Pacific and Towards the uh, second half of this uh, year, we've seen France, Germany, European Union coming up with policy the statements and decisions on Indo-Pacific. And it makes this reason very, very vibrant now. And I'm sure that we all will be looking closely at how we as India are going to negotiate this. The Quad itself will come to play a major role in the future. And it is, you know, I was at least very keen that Abbey stayed on if we wanted to get that Quad in place and, in, and what today it's being talked about as institutionalizing it, then probably Abbey would have played a greater role. And we'll have to wait and see how Suga is going to negotiate uh, internally, his stability, uh, stabilizing himself as well as moving forward with the Quad. But the current Quad, of course, meeting of the foreign ministers, as we all know, has been you know, a little short of the expectations that the world would have had. Uh, but um, I suppose the beginning was required and the beginning has been made after a lot of calls. Um, with respect to um, 
closer home, incidentally, with respect to foreign policy, uh, Abe's records are very, very poor. It was expected that having negotiated as a young cabinet um, person within uh, Koizumi's um, leadership in with respect to the abduction issue of North Korea, he would try to have some kind of alliance happening with North Korea. His first tenure, he did not uh, get much uh, uh, attention from the North Korean premier, but in, the, in his second tenure, North Korea actually became a uh, thorn in his uh, foreign policy because uh, of uh, North Korea's striking capabilities, his missile program, and that fact that uh, the um, young um, North Korean president um, Kim, Kim jong Yong did not want to even meet Abe in the sidelines of any of the meetings and he goes ahead and meets uh, Trump and unfortunately in the meeting with Trump while Abe wanted um, uh, Trump to uh, you know at least put forward Japan's view the, in the statements that came across that there was no statement with respect to Japan. And I think that was sure shot a big failing for him because it is for a country, how much ever you can reach out to the world, if you can't keep uh, some kind of relationship going with your neighbors, it doesn't uh, go well. If you look at even South Korea with comfort and one uh, issue, he was going very strong with President um, Moon, but uh, because of the internal uh, domestic issue, the whole arranged agreement was scuttled and he did not really have anything to take back from South Korea. And from after that, the Korean and South Korea relationship dipped so badly that in fact it went on to a, even a trade war between South Korea and Japan. And it was definitely something that Abe cannot uh, sort of uh, go back with, uh, with a happy feeling because South Korea again is a very important country and especially with asserting China, it was very important to have South Korea in favor of Japan. So these were the two very important areas that Japan lost out to that of um, in the nearer home. And of course, uh, you know, Japan and China's um, uh, relationship has always never been too great, but that, you know, that Seiki Bunro was constant, continued to work even during this regime that economically Japan and China engaged themselves in various, um, not only FDI as well as other kind of MOUs that Japan and uh, China struck uh, with respect to, um, uh, you know, infrastructure work. And as ma'am said, that AIB, AIIB, uh, Japan and uh, China agreed to do um, collaborative financing of projects. However, while uh, one sees uh, moves in economic direction, the political freeze was very uh, cold and uh, one did not see much of an engagement that one could have expected these two countries to uh, come to. And today's uh, Post-COVID, the assertions that uh, Senkaku Island, uh, aggression that China has shown towards Senkaku Island, one does not expect much to happen during this entire uh, period of time. Uh, moving to India-Japan relations, I think um, because of this uh, whole engagement that has opening up uh, in the Indo-Pacific region, the interest towards strat uh, you know, strategic engagement in India, especially in the maritime zone, safeguarding the, goal, uh, the global maritime um, commons has become the goal of both India and Japan. And definitely, therefore, you see a lot of engagement, whether it, because it is with respect to uh, you know, maritime engagement, the, access, the various exercises that uh, one is getting into with, you know, with not only Japan, but also the Quad countries. But I think as a parting gift, what happened uh, with the, the, in the virtual conference between Abe and um, uh, our Prime Minister Modi, this acquisition and cross-servicing agreement, I think that is something that I think the uh, both the army and the navy would be very happy from Indian point of view because it allows each uh, of these countries to access each other's bases. Uh, but I think uh, with uh, this arms trade uh, policy of Japan, I think here is where I think our new domain of uh, engagement will open up and has, I think, a great potential is with respect to the defense equipment and technology. Though we are still having some crisis with respect to the, um, you know, Shimamawe, um, uh, aircraft, but I'm sure um, that, uh, you know, if you look past this small thing, um, you know, engagement, which has not gone in the right uh, order, maybe there would be some others that we should explore where we can have more common platforms to, uh, you know, move towards an engagement in the defense sector. 
Um, of course, economic modernization of India has been well mapped with, with Japanese um, financing, whether it is ODA, FDI, whether in infrastructure development. But what is important is the kind of strategic uh, prince, uh, peripheries that Japan has now started engaging in, whether be it the Northeast um, India or the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. In both these places, we are having, uh, you know, very um, well coordinated approach towards creating, um, uh, you know, uh, infrastructures, which I think would have a strong, uh, uh, you know, influence with respect to how we uh, are in our uh, country's relationship with each other would go. So we are moving away from the economic epicenters to a more, uh, you know, um, larger uh, regions and the Northeast gaining prominence has it would impact not only, um, you know, India-Japan relations, but I think as we try to engage uh, Japan into trying to become a uh, uh, that China plus one uh, supply chain, I think the North uh, East uh, might become a conduit for the regional uh, supply chain uh, engagement that we are now talking about. Not to uh, leave up, uh, leave out the Asia, Africa, Asia growth corridor that was so uh, strongly moved by our Prime Minister Modi. I, and um, Japan, of course, having the TICAD option that it engages with Africa, I think in future, these two uh, you know, platforms might actually need to engage uh, together to come across as a potential of wanting to, to create a more stronger presence in Africa. But what is interesting is it is only in Abe's uh, tenure that we've seen both India and Japan come together in a, um, and engage in a third country investment, though the Chabar thing hasn't gone off well for both of us, but I'm sure the Africa engagement will uh, give us certain amount of extra headway in trying to engage, um, you know, both at the private public partnership or even private private partnership in third country. And I think that is where essentially we will have a larger, um, you know, foothold in the future. Coming to the current uh, prime minister, uh, I think his biggest challenge right now is to ensure that he remains a prime minister beyond 2021 or um, September, because uh, you already have, he has taken two very able people into his uh, two important posts. One is Kato in the cabinet secretary and Kishi in the as a defense minister. But he has definitely sidelined Taro Kano, who was considered to be one of the security specialists of Japan. And this uh, might actually uh, ensure that he would be defending upon Kishi, who is actually brother of Abe, to look towards Abe to give him certain directions with respect to the security question. But given this kind of a, you know, thing where he has uh, in the sidelines wanting to take up the premiership is Ishida who already currently fought, who is one of the, uh, you know, um, leaders of the biggest um, Koi, Kochikai uh, fraction within the LDP. And this person has come out openly to say that he's in talk with Taro Aso as well as Taniguchi fractions to come together during the next election of the LDP leadership. You, one cannot also miss out that uh, Yoshi Hamasa uh, Hayashi, who is currently the, in the House of Councillors, who wants to step down to uh, did, uh, step down and you know uh, move into the House of Representatives such that he could be able to fight for the leadership within the LDP and probably come up, emerge as a prime ministerial candidate in the next election. So this is therefore, you know, Suga has to really negotiate a kind of, a, you know, get a firm footing with respect to his political leadership within the party. And therefore he would obviously be soft peddling every, every and not going in for very strong policy decisions. But I think currently his biggest challenge is to get the Japanese economy to move beyond the stagnation that Japan is facing. And it is something which is really, really worth it with a 29.4% decline. One does not know how Japan can even try to come back to some kind of semblance. His domestic tourism uh, encouragements that uh, he came up with, uh, with has actually backfired on him because people believe that the COVID uh, actually spread much more because of this particular policy or of him. So what does he have therefore uh, to give as an economic stimulus 
one doesn't know because the corporate, uh, if you look at it uh, currently, uh, Abe was keen to promote corporate savings to be used for investment purposes. But unfortunately, with the COVID situation, the corporates have very well learned that the corporates which saved more was actually, uh, you know, be able to float during this period. So essentially, corporates would like to, you know, stick on to their savings rather than try to be more uh, risk taking at this point point of time. So he has to get the trust of the corporate sector back in place. And that is where I think he would be probably trying to give some kind of tax uh, benefits or, you know, uh, give them uh, tax holidays to encourage people to encourage the corporate sector to get back in action. Of course, the, today's news gives us a lot of uh, hope because Japan is opening up its airways. It is now going to allow for international people to come back uh, and are going to also allow for people to go back home and do a home quarantine rather than having quarantine in various um, you know, um, uh, government facilities. So the move uh, towards wanting to become a more uh, get back its economic activity seems to be in place. But uh, since the world itself is going through a crisis, economic crisis and Japan, since it is basically an export led economy in spite of all that one talks about, one does not um, really see how Japan can um, you know, move uh, its economy until unless the rest of the world's economy starts moving in the right direction. So vitalizing domestic economy, which is linked to the export economy would therefore make us look at how Japan is going to look at the supply chain. And it's talking about China plus one. It has given a lot of stimulus to the, China, to the companies in Japan, uh, in China to come back to Japan and as well as look at alternatives. And this is where I think uh, Ma'am and I have been con constantly in conversation with this, that how can we see to it that India actually profits from this particular thing. Japan's um, academic world at least feels very strongly that because India has not signed the RCEP, we are therefore not in a very big advantage to push for this uh, linking up in the supply chain. However, I think given that we have a huge uh, domestic economy, um, and if we can put our act together and create a uh, consumer back, a consumer base, which is constantly looking at consumption, then maybe we should be able to still attract Japanese um, um, investment into India. But if we want to create a good uh, option as becoming a, one part of the supply chain network, I think digitalizing our uh, infrastructures, especially port as well as um, um, getting into the new, you know, the neural network or the 5G network with Japan, which is what uh, the current prime Min uh, foreign minister's meeting has actually moved. We should be looking at some kind of a stronger engagement in uh, with Japan in the near future. I think I'll stop out here. I have very, very important people listening to it, and I'm very shaky of what kind of question that is going to get thrown at me. But I'll be trying to, my best to answer them well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Shavani. You're absolutely wonderful. And you've covered so much, so much of ground. Honestly, I like this report card approach. I think you've been a little conservative in giving him a B plus, perhaps. Yes. I would give him, a, you know, I'd push him up a little more for at least trying. Because there were a lot of things were really out of his control. For example, in the case of South Korea, it was really domestic politics of South Korea, you know, which, which um, came in the way of him improving relations. Uh, similarly with uh, Kim Jong-un, he's such a so it's a sort of maverick. But I saw one of the statements where Abe did say that, uh, that both uh, South Korea and the US had raised the issue of abductees with him. So he seems to have said that he was able to sort of uh, uh, have the issue raised, though this man's refused to meet him. Um, and then, of course, the she visit, you know, he, he managed to get a, get a commitment and for she to talk to him to talk to Suga, you know, directly. So obviously relations are on the, uh, on the mend. Um, interestingly, Suga, yes, he, he will be a little shaky for all the reasons that you have said. Um, and these three important people, you mentioned Taro Kona. What I find is that Suga has given him the important job of um, the structural and administrative <laughs> regulatory reforms, you know, because he wants to shake up the structure. And I don't know whether that will make him more powerful or less powerful that we'll have to wait and see. 
Um, and in so far as our bilateral relations is concerned, as you have said, we've talked a lot about this really. I mean, you know, the proof of the pudding is, you know, why is Japan still fighting shy of investing in, in, into India? I mean, it started off well initially, but, you know, we all know that it's plateauing. And, um, and this whole diversification of supply chains, we don't seem to be anywhere around. Uh, and I would just like to tell the audience that one of the things that uh, Shabani and I have been talking about, and I think what India should target, is really the Japanese companies in China who are manufacturing for India, particularly in key sectors as the automotive sector. Now, I've, I've heard that there were about 200 key suppliers for our automotive sector, which are actually based in China, and these are Japanese companies. I see no reason as to why we should not force them to, you know, to move to India. Of course, there are practical problems. It can't be done overnight. And I know there are problems even of skill, getting you know, properly skilled people who can do some of that, a part of that uh, you know, the, the production, including electronics and so on. But I think we've got to uh, make a beginning. So thank you again, Shravani. I'm sure there are lots of people. Let me just see whether, if there are already some um, questions. I'm not very good at doing this, Judge. Um, yeah, so um, we have one uh, uh, question in the chat box from Shrimati, and she says, um, yeah, I think you've answered it in a way. It says, it was believed by many that Abe would revoke Article 9 of the Constitution. Why did he not do it while in power? Um, I think you've answered it, but, uh, you know, it's also, you could, if, you, if you want to shed light on the, on the very complex process, uh, you know, if he had to revoke art, the article and which is what really also, uh, and that there wasn't a uh, public appetite for it, you might like to yeah. uh, uh, respond to that. And then I look for uh, questions from the rest. Okay. Uh, thank you. It's a very interesting, I know, you know, time and again, people have revisited this Article 9 and tried to see how one can negotiate the Article 9. One thing is, of course, changing this article needs not only a uh, two-third majority, but it has to be ratified by two-third um, of the population of Japan, which is where uh, the problem is. But uh, playing with it was rather what he wanted to do was probably add a little, a few things, uh, ensuring that the, uh, the self-defense force of Japan became, you know, got a center stage within the constitution. I think that was what he aimed for, though it was basically publicly said that he would like to change the constitution and essentially Article 9. Uh, what I think um, Abe's basic reason for not going ahead with it was basically because he did not have uh, a very strong support from the countries which were its neighbors, whether it was South Korea or, um, you know, in fact, uh, you know, Taiwan, Indonesia, none of them would have probably at this juncture favored a uh, change in the Article 9. And I think also with domestically, when he even tried to bring this into the diet as a um, you know, debatable uh, thing. You had a huge public um, uproar over it. And if you looked at the public opinion poll during that period of time, his the public opinion went so much against him that he probably therefore felt that even if he was going to be politically able to negotiate it, it did not occur well for him post, you know, his, uh, you know, this long uh, tenure that he was looking forward to as a prime minister. Um, unfortunately, when, you know, in, if you look at January 2020, um, Abe was really very strong. He thought that, you know, Sh uh, Xi Jinping's visit in February, followed by the Olympics uh, in uh, June, July, would really make him move forward to ensure that his election in the, he would have gone for a, people were actually anticipate an early election after that, and such that he again comes to power and can do the next set of changes. And I think the Constitution Article 9 change would have, uh, would have probably you know, knocked it only after the election. So I think he lost his rounds during this time, especially with North Korea crisis that happened. I think he did not really want to, you know, meddle or tinker with an Article 9 at this juncture. I think that is how I would look at it. I'm sure if anyone else has anything more to say on it. Thanks, Shabani. I think, yeah, you've really covered ground. I think it was really quite difficult. The whole process was such. And some people say that when he moved, there was a dilution in his position over time on what he really wanted and then finally what he had come to, uh, you know, realistically realize, um, to realize what, what he could get, what he could achieve. Uh, Ambassador Nalin Suri has asked a very pertinent question because he says, what do you think Suga's policy on immigration is going to be? 
because when they talked about structural reform, if you recall, one part of it, there was womanomics and there was also immigration and there was a lot of pushback. So I think this is a very interesting question. Uh, yeah, if you look at immigration towards the end of 2015, uh, there was a little change in the immigration, which actually favored Indian immigration uh, immigrants because it allowed for technological um, uh, skill set people to, uh, to move to Japan and even try to uh, get into what is called as permanent residency program. However, I think Japan um, has always been, you know, uh, you know, slow space with, with respect to immigration and not trying, uh, you know, allowing too much of open policy and creating often only country-based options. I think uh, uh, with this uh, demographic challenge that Japan faces, Japan has to sometime uh, face this whole thing of allowing for uh, immigration of even lower down skill sets, because I think over time, that is one place that the crisis is going to emerge because, uh, you know, people do not want to do as they call the dirty, dirty their hands jobs, which like, you know, taking care of the waste, etc. And how much ever AI and robotics are being used, I think some point of time, Japan might have to really move forward in this. It's a very uh, important area of concern, but I think at this particular stage, it will not be figuring much in his um, policy making in the current, say, for the next six months. I do not expect it to be much on his uh, policy making. But um, if the economic recovery starts happening and then the need for, you know, if more Japanese companies are going to be domestically based, then maybe the need for uh, um, more skilled workers would increase, and that is when probably doors would be opened in. I think in small, uh, you know, windows would be open for allowing for skill migration. But allowing opening doors, like many other countries, with you know, where the uh, the migration policies are much more liberal, I don't see that happening from the Japan's end. It is uh, something that the society per se is not in favor of, so it will not see much of a. Um, you know, huge opening is not expected, but, you know, pinpointed small windows that would get opened at this point of time. Um, thank you, Shabni. It's true. I did read somewhere that they were looking at immigration once again, because as you know, there was pushback. But what is happening, Billy Nili, is very interesting, because uh, even by the, while I was there, the number of Chinese, for example, that you found in the countryside, because, you know, the countryside is completely denuded of people. Everybody's moved to the cities. And you find a lot of them who came even under this uh, program, which was called the Technical Industrial Training Program, I think, which we have also signed on to, where they would come under that program and actually end up working in, in the agricultural sector or stay on and not go back. Uh, so they do have their preferred nationalities. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, they will be forced certainly at some point or the other to open their doors, but they will be picky. Um, and beyond that, I think, you know, there's something that we should really... Um, uh, we should look at uh, very carefully when we also want uh, and we want to see more Indians uh, going to work in Japan. We have to also see the conditions under which they're going, particularly under programs such as the TITP. Um, Ambassador, I will continue with Ambassador Suri. He has another interesting question. He says, will uh, Suga continue to seek normalization of relations with Russia? You know, this is one of the three unfinished tasks that Abe mentioned. Shabani, what you I, I personally think, yes, I think there is no reason why um, Suga shouldn't uh, move towards engaging with Russia and sorting this territorial issue, which is basically more of a political uh, issue. And it has a strong implication for Japan to sort of set up, you know, one uh, of its, uh, you know, neighbors, uh, close, you know, territorial neighbors at peace. And since with Russia, it has the same kind of, you know, meeting once a year, um, among the premiers as already an established platform. I think this uh, engaging and trying to get the territorial um, uh, issue sorted out with um, Russia would be in his uh, agenda early on. I think it would be something that would be tackled early on. But I think election of your um, US would be one thing that would uh, make him wa wait and watch till he starts, uh, you know, giving in, you know, his, uh, is uh, laid out interest in the foreign policy. I wonder how the conversation with uh, Putin had gone and, you know, not very, uh, no, how not it had gone. Much. And they did talk, of, you know, they've been talk uh, of economic cooperation and everything else short 
really of uh, you know of, of this the return of the two islands which was far more difficult um i uh, ambassador uh, gautam mamawale who really handled japan for a very long time he says uh, he has asked do you expect suga to also do a long stint as prime minister like abe or will politics in japan revert to a system of quick changes in their pm will political stability be a legacy of abe <laughs> um see abe had a few advantage one was of course he had a you know he has a um his you know his um, you know genetic ascendancy as i call it in the political field you know having such you know important uh, people backing up his grandfather father and then um his small stint with koizumi before he comes into um, power and uh, of course his uh, suga has always is a self made man typical japanese concept of you know moving from a very ordinary family to this level and he spent 8 years with him um, you know being his shadow literally as a cabinet secretary uh, i wish him well because uh, he seems to be a very strong you know in what directions he wants to take the country otherwise one wouldn't have ruffled the feathers so early on with respect to the science uh, council where he Uh, you know shot down few academic people and people are criticizing him for it because they feel that he wants to muzzle his way through and create an autocratic uh, thing while he has come back to say that was not he didn't have any uh, strong intentions of curtailing independent thinking but he has also not really given reasons why he's done it so that it did show that he wants to show that uh, i'm uh, the person i am the leader in this whole thing and it's coming so early on in his uh, tenure it says probably does say what many few scholars when he took over power did say that he has certain intentions and it's very he keeps it very close to his heart and he will play it out when he wants to and probably the science council is something which actually shows that that is how he will go uh, go out and do things without really giving an explanation for it which wouldn't go well in a democratic setup but and especially with his current as i said the instable leadership that he has he might be having uh, he will have issues to contend with so it's really very early to say whether he can have a long tenure um if he can survive the next coming election then i think we can see a more of a you know a more uh, you know focused and outgoing suga than what he is going to be in this interim period It's interesting. You see, uh, I think um, as long as Abe is there and he's going to play the puppeteer, he'd probably prefer uh, Suga, at least in, in you know in the short term, uh, than anybody else. Because this entire election and selection process was to keep Ishiba out, and to have a man that you know he was close to. But on the other hand, um, yeah, Suga is his own man. Uh, in fact um, ambassador bambawali has asked this question and he would remember a guy called imai imai used to be in kanthe and very very powerful kind of uh, personal secretary almost it was he was from meti and he was there in in uh, the prime minister's office right through the the eight years and this entire meti group uh, that has been there in uh, in kanthe the prime minister's office has apparently been eased out so you know suga is his own man um whether this is going to big, help him get more enemies or friends one doesn't know but um, it'll be interesting so far of course um, the major factions were with him even people like nikai have been with him but we'll have to see how he plays the various groups uh, and and the important ldp leaders but um i think uh, i was mentioning to shabani and i'll just share with you all that uh, you know um he has not been part of any group suga's not part of any one of any other factions but there was a very interesting article recently on a new group called ganesha nokai ganesha like in in, in lord ganesha and um, these are people who are supporters of suga across various groups and the people who have known him and you know the choice of the name is very interesting that they should choose to call themselves uh, ganesha nokai it's not a faction but so he does have some support you know within uh, among various factions um uh, ashok uh, ashokant has said uh, has asked uh, Japan under Abe had a bit of a roller coaster ride in relations with China period of turbulence followed by a measure of rapprochement which was to culminate in Xi Jinping's visit to Japan in April 2020 however underlying tensions and structural changes remain how do you see this relationship um evolving 
I, I'll, I'll take the other question, which yeah. is from uh, Alka, because it's also a sort of China question in some way. She says one of um, uh, one of him, this, him and that. There's a reason for his resignation. Sorry, this is about actually Abe. You, you do the China one. We'll come back to this. Later. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, you know, currently China uh, issue is, is become more difficult to really assess because uh, with respect to Japan alone, it is no longer, you know, the China's aggressive posture, the great power politics that is getting played out, uh, you know, post COVID or during this COVID e period actually makes uh, it much more difficult to say how Japan, uh, China would, uh, you know, um, relationship will progress because previous to this, everyone said whatever happened politically, economically, things are going to be uh, very conducive between these two countries because both of them needs each other. But right now with this whole decoupling issue and, uh, you know, how uh, the Quad is also trying to uh, come together and try, uh, trying to move away from the uh, China-based uh, supply chain orientation essentially would look at towards actually disengaging from with China even economically. And therefore, the issue that one is ask, asking is, is it easy to actually decouple from a country where you move from 1970 onwards? Or you know, if you are going to be moving out, what you cannot sort of probably move out everything. So you would continue to have to have an economic engagement. So can you therefore be politically very distanced from that country and China being a neighbor? But aggressiveness that China has shown towards Senkaku Islands actually uh, sends a lot of fear to Japan, and especially with USA uh, and Trump's this, uh, you know, this trying to, you know, reverse its role with uh, in the alliance system, creates for Japan a situation where Japan would be worried with respect to how China is going to engage themselves. Um, I think for me, my take would be that uh, it is going to be a much more uh, rockier uh, relationship for the next at least year or two. Still, we see some kind of economically engaging all, all this decoupling that one is talking about at the ground level, how it will emerge. And that would sort of signify for us the kind of economic disengagement that is going to happen with China. If this thing happens and the process is smooth, then probably Japan would become more assertive with respect to how it engages itself politically with China. However, we always know with China, it has always been keeping the politics and the economics separate. So could be as they de-engage, disengage themselves from China economically, maybe China and Japan would uh, you know, find options of trying to become closer. But the current reading is definitely not in those directions with the way uh, Japan's, uh, China has shown aggressiveness with respect to Senkaku Island almost every third, fourth day, one years of you know, uh, the territorial encroachment that uh, China is engaging in. So I think that is how I will look at China's uh, and Japan's relationship for the next year or so. Right. Um yeah, Shabni, I think so. I, you know, but uh, on this decoupling, one interesting thing that has happened is that you know, corporate Japan for the first time is standing up to the government and saying they don't want this decoupling. So the head of the Kedan Run has come out and said that you know this is not something that we, you know, that that that, that, that he personally would really be in favor of. The head of Nidec, which you know, mm -hmm. this is this company which makes motors and has several factories, I think, both in China and in India. Uh, they also have, he, the head of this has also come out and said the same thing. So a lot of people are really opposing the decoupling. I mean, so I have a feeling this is going to be some tinkering unless, you know, something uh, and uh, nothing really very deep. Because after all, a lot of the uh, Japanese companies in China are looking at the China markets itself. And they've been there. There's a comfort. They've been there for such a long time. So um, that decoupling is going to take some time. But on the other hand, of course, there is concern about the Senkakus. And what happened was that, uh, you know, uh, that there were about 100 uh, LDP lawmakers who came out and said that uh, Xi Jinping's uh, the, uh, visit should be cancelled. I mean, that's postponed, but it should be cancelled because of what is happening in the Senkakus. Because I think for 111 days or so, continuously consecutive days that there were incursions in the waters and the airspace. So uh, they had asked for a cancellation. And there's another group of them who are saying that, you know, calling on the Americans to be to jointly patrol the waters around here, uh, around the Senkapus. So, I mean, that is going to continue on one hand. And one hand, you know, this is, be, I, I think, more or less uh, what is 
been there in the past. But uh, from what it seems is that the Xi Jinping visit, uh, they they haven't come up with dates, but it's you know they probably they are looking at when what would be a appropriate time for the visit to happen. And when this visit happens, what I read somewhere was that every ten years they come out with kind of a statement. Uh, the last time Hu Chinta was there was about twelve years ago, and then there's a statement which kind of sets the path for the next ten years of relations, and they're a little worried about that. Because you know uh, they feel that uh, China should actually um, change its behavior, and so far as the Central Court is concerned, before they talk about that uh, uh, that uh, joint um, uh, agreement on policy, um, which um, over the the two relations, which governs the relations. Um, the uh, I have uh, uh, now Alka's question. Yeah, uh, she says that one of Heyman Heyman and Alka's articles talks of how many scholars in Japan and China do not give. Credence to Abe's declining health as a reason for his resignation. What, if any, has been the U.S. role here? Do Japanese experts or Japan watchers in the West see a possible connection between Prime Minister's resignation and the worsening U.S.-China rivalry? Conspiracy theory, <laughs> Shabani, what do you have to say? Yeah, um, yeah, you know, uh, it was interesting as soon as Abe uh, uh, sort of uh, announced that he was going to. Uh, you know, uh, resign. Uh, ma many in the academic world did believe that he did not want to face the downturn to of the economy, the domestic. Uh, you know, the he wanted to leave when the everything was better than he anticipates things to only go worse, and uh, therefore he wanted to sort of resign at that point of time. Because if you look at the 2007 resignation, that was also very sudden. And uh, one did, uh, you know, was he later said it was because of his uh, illness. But uh, people believe that he realized that he wouldn't be able to take the country forward in the direction that he wanted to. And that's why, you know, he sort of said, you know, himself away. And he came up with this, my beautiful world, uh, you know, Usuki uh, Kuni, uh, where he tried to say that this is what I want to, I look at Japan as a beautiful country in this world. And this is my policy, which on which he wrote his uh, 2012 uh, election manifesto and therefore came into power. If you look at that phase and you look at this sudden resignation again, so one once links up to that sudden resignation, one feels that maybe is he stepping back because he would have to take to see, you know, decisions which would be mar his image as a progressive leadership, and therefore, you know, wait out again and probably come back when, you know, the bad phase of uh, this COVID situation is taken care of and certain, you know, kind of direction is got in, in this world, and therefore he would move forward. But these are all only, you know, contemplation of what. Uh, one thinks because of past actions and the current uh, situation. But I wouldn't uh, sort of buy this argument that he stepped down because he was very keen to actually show Jap the new Japan and the stronger Japan in the um, uh, current, you know, the Olympics that has got deferred for a year. And I think he wanted to be part of that uh, huge uh, world attention that one gets during the Olympics. So. Uh, my take is very different. I do not believe it. Yeah, that was a sense one got that he was genuinely ill because reports of his ill health was, were coming in from June. But you know, whether he will, we can write him off that whether he will come back again, that I'm not sure about because in several of his statements, he says that he has now got a new course of treatment and he's responding very well to it. So that says, you know, and he's on the mend. So, I mean, I don't know whether we're really uh, ready to, uh, to write him off. Uh, I see Yogi, um, uh, Ambassador Yogendra Kumar, I think he wants to ask a question. Yogi, yes, please unmute yourself and ask. Uh, thank you. Uh, very informative, very interesting. Uh, on the Japan-China relations, I was struck by the fact that uh, after Suga was elected as a prime minister, Xi Jinping was the first person to call him and congratulate him. And at the same time, Li Keqiang sent him a massive congratulations. And within a few weeks after that, there was another telephone conversation between the two. I'm just wondering, I don't know whether who initiated the call, was Xi Jinping or Suga. But it seems that perhaps the Chinese leadership feels that with the departure of Abe, perhaps there is some possibility of another opening uh, with, uh, in, in, the, in the bilateral relations. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Yogi. Uh, yeah, Shavani. 
what do you have to say um but you know the uh, of course you know everyone looks forward to seeing who calls first who calls second um kind of thing and i think in the diplomatic circle it's a huge uh, you know uh, kind of uh, news but if you look at the uh, things like you know if you look at even many other countries when we look at this whole thing probably uh, xi jinping was reaching out uh, to suba because uh, he might uh, the personal equation with abe i believe was not too great between the two leaderships maybe it is a signal of trying to as uh, he, uh, ambassador yogi said that it was a sign that probably a new um, kind of uh, move towards a better relationship between um, japan and uh, china but i consider there to be a you know like if that is true then why is it that we are having so much of incursion in senkaku island and thing where it is so strongly uh, embedded in japanese people's mind that the senkaku island is theirs and it has a huge place in uh, current uh, relationship between japan and china so if that is true that there is a kind of wanting to have get into a better phase then why is this uh, incursions happening in senkaku i would question that rather and on that basis i wouldn't say that one could expect much in the current uh, you know uh, year you know within the next 6 months i don't expect suddenly china would withdraw from all these actions that it is you know asserting itself across uh, various places we faced it the south china sea is constantly in a turmoil right now so i personally do not think that japan and china would anyway move towards any kind of changes in its bilateral engagement in the near future near future would i would say it, you know till around another 6 8 months uh, we they would be on the same rocky uh, uh, relationship and while we are on china one more questions from ambassador nalin suri and i'm mentioning it because we're still on china and he asked will suga enhance the relationship with taiwan there's been a lot of speculation about yeah, this because yeah. also because of a uh, because of uh, defense minister kishi yeah i uh, kishi has a very strong um, approach towards taiwan and taiwan is a huge uh, country if you're going to be decoupling from china china can be a uh, taiwan can be a good base especially with the you know the computer based com components etc so probably uh, taiwan would gain a lot of uh, importance but then uh, Taiwan gaining a lot of importance with uh, Japan would obviously have a very strong impact with China's relationship because China obviously does not like to encourage or accept uh, Taiwan as a player in the international forum so uh, but however uh, currently i think uh, as far as you know we had recently heard one of the taiwanese um, speaking on this aspect about taiwan is how they are looking at the leadership they are definitely strongly looking at um, japan as a you know person of a um, uh, country that would stand by taiwan during the crisis uh, during any kind of crisis that might embroil in taiwan in the near future especially with hong kong being in such a state so um, uh, taiwan would probably become much more but i think japan would uh, more closely look into the asean centrality aspect and the indo pacific what at least gives us certain indication that uh, these countries would really play out in the indo pacific uh, in the coming future so i look at it in those lines so it's interesting actually um uh, ambassador suri's question because you see what happened was that i think when nobu kishi was made defense uh, minister he headed a small group in i think the diet which was very pro taiwan and it says that when saying man was in the opposition she was not uh, she, uh, before her election that he had actually introduced her to abe and taken her to yamaguchi to web uh, prime minister abe was and then with when president lee at, at the funeral i think prime minister former prime minister mori had gone and there he apparently told her that there would be a telephonic conversation between suga and her and then later everybody had to come the chinese reacted and they had to come and say no no that wouldn't happen but uh, certainly i think um, you know relation with taiwan anyway on the economic side are very good and uh, it'll be nice to see how they would uh, actually you know leverage that to their own benefit um one uh, mr venkat raman uh, he has a question he says uh, uh, this is to shabani what is the likely impact of the change of the leadership in japan on 
India and the Quad? All of us have been witness to the Quad engagement that happened among the foreign ministers um, in Japan. The fact that everyone flew down, I think that itself uh, indicates that there's seriousness to it. Of course, um, you know, America's position is pretty clear. It wants to institutionalize the system. But now is the fact that we didn't have a joint statement also says that you know the four players are not in, um, you know, I don't have a strong um, understanding to know how they wanted to take forward. Uh, we, what has had a very, uh, you know, it started off and... It started off and uh, we had this whole, uh, and a uh, whole uh, process of, you know, Australia walking away because uh, China didn't approve. You had India also soft peddling the whole thing and not really engaging itself in the quad because of the fear of how China was going to look at it. So it didn't really take off initially, but by 2017, again, it was back. Kabe also tried uh, to come up with this uh, diamond, security diamond uh, concept. And then finally, again, the Quad was back. But during the COVID, you saw that Quad plus one engagement, even at the height of COVID situation, especially for India, when we were under a lockdown, we they still engaged in a Quad plus uh, format and current thing. So I think um, the post uh, COVID does show a strong tendency for the Quad to come together. Um, Obviously, what underlying thing is to contain China or to at least uh, come together to give a, a kind of position itself to ensure that China um, uh, is able to, you know, uh, confirm to the open, uh, uh, free, open Indo-Pacific uh, concept of, you know, value-based order. So I think that is how we could look at it. And India-Japan relationship, if you look at it, we already have a vision for Indo-Pacific for 2025. So it goes beyond the Abbey's um, uh, tenure now. And uh, the vision has a lot of um, you know, engagements between India and Japan. Um, and therefore, both economic front, militarily with uh, defense sector, both with respect to engaging in uh, exercises, et cetera. So I think we are on uh, you know, road towards a more clearer, more um, structured quad uh, engagement in future. Thanks, Shabani. I think this is the last one that we'll take now. It is um, from Ambassador Yogendra Kumar. He says, um, on the Senkakus, have the Chinese incursions remained the same in frequency or reduced after Suga's election? I'm sorry, I really haven't for, uh, followed the numbers. I tried to just now get into my mobile and try to see if I could get any information on this i also didn't come across any information i'm very sorry for that yeah anyway we shall certainly look up but thank you so much it's been most interesting thank you shabani i think we covered a lot of ground you know there's very i think uh, since there's so much of china focus uh, what happens is japan gets a little left out and i think you know you have covered so much so that people get an understanding of not only what happens in Japan, but its importance in East Asia, in, in the Indo-Pacific, and in the context of our own bilateral relations. And I think something that all of us follow very closely, really, um, in this group are Japan-China relations and where they will go and will Xi Jinping finally visit and, you know, will it be, um, I mean, what will be the outcome? So uh, with that, I'd just like to thank all of you for being here. Thank you, Ashok. And thank you all of them, all, uh, all your colleagues at the uh, ICS who help organize this.